This is the final workshop, um, and it's about the sort of outcomes and feedback, uh, which links uh, to a lot of the themes that have been talked about today, both in terms of outcome evaluation, uh, but more importantly, and this is a bit I want to focus on in terms of collaborative practice and uh, participation, but in the clinic room, so a particular kind of participation. Uh, this is who I am. I'm Duncan Law. Uh, I'm a clinician working out in Hertfordshire in one of the Phase 1 IAP sites, uh, and uh, also a clinical lead for CYP IAP for the London South East Collaborative. Uh, all these logos here are all the logos of where I've nicked ideas uh, and exercises from to do this workshop with. Um, so I don't pretend that these are all my ideas. Some of them are, uh, but uh, a lot of them have been borrowed and stolen from other people. Okay, I um, want to start by asking you what you want. We've got about an hour, uh, so I just want to know what you want in this next hour. We may not be able to provide everything you want, but if we can get some ideas, uh, then we can try and focus in the discussion to some of the things that you want to get out of it. So what I'd like you to do is to start, just turn to the person next to you, uh, 30 seconds just to say one thing that you want to get out of this next hour, uh, and then we'll get some thoughts, not thoughts from everybody. Uh, when I, when, when I, I sort of uh, agreed to do this, I was expecting a sort of small group of about 10 people in a tiny room downstairs, uh, and he said, we've got loads of you in this big echoey room and a massive stage, which is not helpful for running a workshop, but hey. So just turn to your neighbor. One thing that you want to get out of this next bit, uh, and then we'll get thoughts from some of you, and then uh, we'll get on with the rest of it. So off you go. <laughs> right, OK. So uh, thoughts from somewhere around the front here, just uh, an idea about what you, what you want. Yes. 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 The other part, I guess, is just looking at some practical tips, um, because I come from an organisation where we don't routinely use these types of outcome measures in sessions. Um, so if, you know, do you have any tips and skills to how we can do it without being cumbersome? I don't, but the other people in the room do. Uh, and we're going to draw on those. So, yeah. Thought from over this side? Uh, the practicalities of it, they can be uh, as useful as you want in sessions, but if the clinician then has to spend another hour entering the data into a database, then actually it's not going to be used right. in reality. So uh, what, what do you want from the, this? The systems, get, how, how do I, I'm a third wave site. Yeah. Well, not personally, but yeah. <laughs> uh, how do you get the systems to work? Right. The, okay. the, the system of getting the, out, get, you're getting the family to fill in the measures, getting them uploaded, and having them usefully available for the next session for the clinician. Right. Okay. Uh, short, very quick answer to that. Uh, I'm not going to get into all the IT stuff because there's not time. But the short answer is you don't need an IT system at all to make this clinically useful. All, all the session-by-session session tools are easily scored and looked at. You, you don't need an IT system to, to, to get the data back. Uh, the uh, question is that you might use at the beginning if you want to use the RCADs or the STQ. Those are a bit more sophisticated. It's very difficult to score those quickly, and you do need an IT system for that. Um, but the session-by-session session tools need no IT at all. They, they are easily used in a, in a very low-tech way. So uh, that, that's all I'm going to say on that. The IT issue is a much bigger and broader one, and I, I agree, it needs to be sorted. May I ask to have this microphone? Okay, so, go ahead sorry. then. Yeah, use it. Um, two things, actually. One is how to use um, outcome monitoring as part of supervision. Right, yeah. And secondly, how to use the outcomes in conjunction with CAPA, in other words, when do we use which outcomes, when, in terms of choice, partnership, you know, etc. Okay. Does that fine. make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'll have one more thought. I say we won't have time for everybody, otherwise we'll just get the thoughts about what you want. We won't have any chance to sort of deliver anything. So, one last. Hi, I'm a participation worker in Bristol, and um, I want to get a greater insight into 
comes clinicians' feelings and views about what you described as participation in the clinic room? So you want to hear clinicians' thoughts yeah. on... and how I can support better. Right, OK. Uh, right. Fine. OK. Good. Right. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to talk for a little bit, uh, and I'll answer some of these as we go, and then uh, most of the time I want you to do something uh, and when we get feedback, we'll try and, and kind of cover these, uh, uh, cover some of these comments. This one, I can't promise this one. Okay, we'll just see how we do on the inspiration. But that's, that's down to you lot in the room. Um, I, I'm not going to promise that. Okay, uh, we asked you early on what your feelings were about outcome measures. I won't talk about that. Uh, I do just want to remind you of the values behind this. This was said earlier. Miranda Wolpert talked about it really uh, uh, eloquently. Uh, but just a reminder, so there are two values behind this. I think we shouldn't uh, worry too much. Uh, well, we need to worry a bit, but not, not get sort of over-occupied by whether these are the right tools for doing this job. The, the important thing is to focus on what the values are and what we're trying to achieve. Uh, my hope is that we'll look back in 10 years' time uh, and uh, a bit of the way we might look back at computers and IT systems were 10 years ago. They look horribly outdated, and we can't believe that we're actually using that stuff. Uh, I hope that we've got the same ambition here, that we'll look back at the kind of tools and the ways of collecting this kind of data that we have now, and we'll say, gosh, didn't that look terribly out of date back then? Because people will have used things, and they will have developed so much. That's my hope. Uh, so part of it is to demonstrate, celebrate, prove uh, that the services that we offer and what we do as clinicians are effective. Uh, so we have to show that to, uh, it's perfectly reasonable that uh, to be given a lot of taxpayers' money or charitable donations, whatever sector you work in, uh, that, uh, that, that we get something, the public gets something back out of that. So to be able to show and demonstrate that we do a good job, uh, that's one of the values behind this. The other one, the one that's much more interesting to me, and I, I'm guessing to you, is about, uh, uh, and this is the participation bit, in terms of that it's about better collaborative practice in the room, uh, in the clinic setting, uh, both in terms of allowing another channel for service users to have their say about the work and the way it's going and how you're working together with a young person uh, in order to facilitate better clinical practice. So for young people to be able to tell us more, they already do tell us about how we do, but to be able to tell us more about how we're doing so that we can do a better job and then they can tell us whether we're doing, uh, still doing a better job and so on. So it's a, it's a sort of uh, circular process. Okay. Um, so, again, I won't go into this, but you'll know this is the 90% target, so the, re the requirement is that uh, you submit data on at least uh, two time points with one of the measures that have clinical norms and have at least one report of education, employment, and training. Uh, more information on the IAP website. But uh, for me, it's not the interesting bit isn't about the, the evaluation side. Uh, it's about the better collaborative practice about working together, about clinicians and young people and the families that we work with finding ways of working more closely together. Uh, OK. Uh, quick video of young people and what they have to say about outcomes. To make sure they're happy with the service and they don't feel um, pressured or uncomfortable with whoever they're with. And also things might change from session to session, so, um, you know, say if you were to do it monthly and four sessions have passed, somebody could, like, have dramatically um, gone down in mood and it's something yeah. that could have been spotted if you were to do the session by session. Yeah, it would build the confidence as well to know that they're progressing and that it will show them that it's helping as well. So they could improve the way they act um, towards young people, um, which ultimately would um, 
get the young people to actually relate to them better, um, and the young people I, and the, ther the therapist could, um, in my opinion, kind of have more of a friend-friend relationship rather than a higher authority and a younger authority. Obviously it's quite interesting to hear our views and see how they compare to more adult views and see whether it is possible for us actually to work together and find sort of like a common ground. Um, I think it is a good idea to ask, but I still don't think necessarily people are going to be honest every week. Take out message is, uh, it might be helpful if it's done properly and it's up to us and with young people uh, to make sure that we, we do it properly and do it in a way that is helpful and effective. Uh, here are some other thoughts from, uh, these are, uh, the, the, in the gift presentation there was a mention of uh, the young people who'd uh, added uh, thoughts to the, the co-op document, the guide to using the tools. Uh, here's a couple of quotes that they get sent back. Uh, so the, again, the takeout message is uh, use them, but use them well. If they're used well, uh, they can be helpful. And these next two quotes, the takeout message is, uh, but if they're not used well, and that means that if young people don't know why they're being asked to fill them out, and that goes for clinicians as well. So if we don't know why we're asking young people to do this, uh, young people certainly won't uh, get the message. Uh, and if there's no feedback given to young people, so we, it's all very well asking someone to fill out a questionnaire and then taking it away. If that feedback then is not given back to the young person, uh, then they stop doing it. They disengage. Uh, they might still fill out the questionnaires, but you're not getting anything useful back and rather than sending a message to young people that we want to hear their feedback, that their voice is valuable, we send a message which says, actually, uh, we're not really interested and we're just, we're just doing, uh, going through the motions. So uh, again, to echo something that Miranda Wolpert said earlier, we know that uh, this can have damaging effects uh, and it's about you using your clinical judgment to make sure that you're doing it as best you can and you're using your clinical judgment to, to use the tools in the way that you feel is most effective. Okay, two quick things about the evidence base. Again, this was mentioned earlier, but just to sort of mention a little bit more in detail. So uh, Mike Lambert, who's written tons on this, uh, and here's a reference which is uh, pretty good in terms of a summary of the work in adult mental health. Uh, so Mike Lambert did a piece of work where he worked out the expected trajectories of intervention. So how, how, are, how would you expect an intervention to go? So uh, he said, OK, if, if uh, uh, someone comes in scoring up here, so uh, things are pretty serious, we can predict uh, how, that, how they would, uh, an intervention would be likely to go. So you would tend to see someone get a bit better, a bit worse, a bit better again, bit worse. Uh, if you stayed within this expected trajectory, the feedback that he gave to clinicians was just a green flag, so everything's fine. If someone got unexpectedly worse, so dropped out of this expected trajectory, so weren't doing as well as we might expect them to do compared with uh, your, your average person going through therapy, if they dropped out from this trajectory, uh, it would be a little red flag. So the clinicians would just get against that person's name a little red flag saying, look, this person isn't doing as well as expected. Uh, and what Lambert found was if you gave clinicians just that small bit of information, someone's not doing as well as expected, uh, it reduced dropout and you got better outcomes. But the interesting bit was that you it didn't and didn't need to give any advice to clinicians about what to do. They just said, look, this doesn't look as if it's heading in the right direction over to you as clinicians. And, and what clinicians did was to use, you know, our, your expertise to decide, okay, is this helpful information to me? What do I need to do differently to help get things back on track? Uh, in child mental health, uh, Len Bigman, again, this is another uh, study from the States, but a, a massive randomized control trial, 28 sites, 10 different states, uh, in sort of real-world camp settings, uh, the, the sorts of settings that we work in, okay? So these aren't uh, fancy, private, uh, uh, American uh, camp services. These are Medicare-funded services, the majority of them. Uh, and there were two conditions. One where clinicians got weekly feedback. So 
uh, every week on all the young people that you saw, you got some sort of feedback uh, as to how they were doing. Uh, and in the other condition, people just got the feedback every three months, so long gaps between getting any sort of feedback. Uh, and again, what Bigman found in this big trial was that there were the ones where there was weekly feedback uh, got faster improvement. So the young people got better quicker. Uh, but here's the thing that I think is really interesting uh, and encouraging. I kind of paraphrase the, the findings here. Uh, but what Bigman found was that, well, in the, in the actual write-up of the study, Len Bigman says that the more clinicians you looked at the feedback, the, the, the better the outcome became. Uh, and me and some colleagues went out to, uh, to meet with some of the clinicians who were involved in this, this trial, and we said to them, look, um, did you really look at this feedback? And they said, not really. We got it, but we didn't really look at it. We were too busy. We were back to back. Uh, we just didn't have time to look at the feedback. Uh, and yet, it's still those where, where they got sent the weekly feedback got better and quicker outcomes. So uh, the thing that's heartening to me, because we know that clinicians, and particularly if we haven't got IT systems that uh, function as well as we like, uh, they don't look at the feedback. But there's something that goes on here which suggests that even, you know, there's something about using these tools or being in a culture where feedback's important that improves outcomes. Now, we don't know whether that's quite what's going on here, but there's, it's, it's not just about looking at the data and using it in some way. Okay. Uh, Last couple of things that I'm going to say, and then we're, I'm going to ask you to, to, uh, to share your learning amongst yourselves. Uh, so this answers the, the next bit. Um, I hope we'll answer the Kappa question. Um, yeah, certainly that one. Okay. So um, again, something you've seen earlier today. Uh, so these are sort of what we think are six useful questions that whatever mode of therapy you're doing, whatever kind of presenting difficulties young people and families are coming with, uh, we think these are kind of six helpful questions that you may want to ask as a clinician. So what's the problem? What, what, what's got you here in the first place? Uh, what do you want to change? So what do you want to be different? Uh, to sometimes these things are related, sometimes they're not. Uh, and then in the ongoing bit of the work, uh, how are we getting on together? You know, is this, are we doing all right together? Are we, um, you know, are we sort of uh, work heading in the right direction? Um, does it feel like that we're working collaboratively or not? Uh, and then how are things going? So we, we might feel we're working collaboratively, but are things heading in a direction that we want them to head in? Are you working towards, are things progressing to the changes that you want to make in your life? And then towards the end of the intervention, uh, have we done as much as we can or we need to? Uh, and then how was the experience of the service overall? Um, and these are six questions which are useful to ask. And the toolkit, the questionnaires, the forms that have, have been designed for IAPT uh, are designed to fit around to facilitate the answers to these questions. Now, the questionnaires don't, aren't the only way of getting this information, and it would be, uh, I'd be horrified if that's all you were using, uh, but most of it you'll get from good clinical discussions and observations. The idea about the tools are that they can add and just add some other information that might be in addition to what you've got through talking, or uh, might just give you a piece of information that you wouldn't get through just a normal conversation. Uh, and we know from other studies uh, that uh, young people and families, however good we are and however hard we try by just having clinical discussions with young people, there are very few therapists who can really pull it off uh, and get really good uh, feedback from young people. I know from my own experience, uh, and I don't even pretend to be a great therapist. Okay, so in terms of CAPA, yeah, so choice appointment... Uh, you're using tools about what's the problem. So uh, the RCADs might be helpful if you're working with anxiety and depression particularly, uh, and the SDQ. Um, or the, uh, the um, 
ORS, the outcomes rating scale, might also be helpful in that. So what, you know, what, 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 where, what, where does the problem lie? Uh, in terms of what you want to change, uh, then using the goals-based outcome tool might be one of the things that's helpful. So that's at the choice appointment. In terms of partnership and the ongoing work, uh, how are we getting on together? Uh, there's the session feedback questionnaire or the, the SRS. Uh, and how are things going? There's the whole uh, batch of uh, symptom trackers that are in the toolkit. So CAPA and the IAPT, this, this bit of IAPT framework completely map onto each other. There's, there's uh, no fight between them at all. Right. Uh, okay, just before we uh, ask you to do something, uh, it might be helpful to bear this in mind. So, uh, for those of you who are just embarking on this, uh, the IAP project, um, and for those of you who are, have used it a lot, uh, this may be familiar to you. Uh, this has come from a, a slightly separate project that we did, uh, a, a sort of connected but set outside of the IAP, main IAP project, uh, where we were asking uh, services, to, amongst other things, to use the goal-based outcome tool. Uh, and we were monitoring clinicians' sort of responses and how they felt about introducing this tool, which was new to them. Um, and they kind of pretty much said they went through these three different states. So the first one was around apprehension. This is a new thing. Uh, we think we're doing a good job as clinicians. We're trying to do the best we can. And we're being asked to do something uh, on top of that, which... Uh, the fear was that it might interfere and detract from the work rather than add to it. Uh, when they uh, got on and tried using the tool, uh, then it felt quite clunky at first, that um, it didn't fit neatly, it didn't fit smoothly with the general uh, clinical practice and conversations that they were used to having. But over time, with practice, it started to feel more integrated and fit more smoothly with uh, their normal clinical practice. But the interesting thing is that clinicians didn't move from there through this to here, that uh, it, they move between these different states at different times. So at times you might have felt that actually this was starting to feel integrated, uh, and then suddenly it was starting to feel clunky again. Um, or it was starting to feel integrated, and then suddenly people started to feel anxious again and apprehensive, maybe because of the kind of feedback they were getting. Uh, so I, I just... Um, wanted to raise this with you uh, because this is, uh, I think this also fits with what clinicians have told us when they're using the whole range of the IAP toolkit, that these are states, and I think it's helpful to know that these are sort of states that clinicians uh, find themselves in. Uh, and I, I suspect, I'd be interested to know whether uh, young people feel that uh, as well. Okay, let me pause there. Any questions so far or comments on any of this? linked to the question about supervision, I was thinking that some um, clinicians are very familiar with using questionnaires and some yeah. clinicians never use questionnaires. Yes. And I was thinking in your, in terms of being a year one service, what support or help you found useful for supervisors who are not familiar with the questionnaires, who are then having to talk about them in supervision and help the people they're supervising? Yeah. Um, Two things. One is that for the best way for supervisors to feel comfortable in supervision is to feel comfortable in using them themselves in their own clinical practice. That, that's, that's, I think that would be the key learning. Um, and the second is that, uh, that to learn together with the person that you're supervising. So this is, if this is new to both of you, uh, you don't need to pretend as a supervisor that you know everything and the person you're supervising is the one who's learning uh, to, to use it collaboratively and look at it together and say, you know, what sense do we make of this together? One of the really think, useful things that I think supervisors can do are to uh, either challenge or help clinicians come up with alternative stories about the, the information that they get back. So, um, you may get uh, uh, a, a young person where... On the symptom trackers, so... Uh, uh, symptom trackers high suggest there's more difficulty, low suggests there's, there are fewer difficulties. Uh, so uh, you may get a young person who kind of bumps along like that. Okay? Uh, here's the clinical cutoff, so well above the clinical cutoff. 
uh, and uh, someone might bring that to supervision, or you as a supervisor might say, let's have a look at this person, because um, they've had you know, a number of sessions and nothing's really changed. Uh, let's have a think about it together. Um, so, the cl and, and I think a helpful thing to do today is clinician, you know, tell me about the, the clinical story around this chart. So, uh, don't just go with the numbers, go with the whole clinical story. Um, and clinicians, we're very good at coming up with stories. That's what we do a lot. We come up with stories that explain uh, what's going on for young people and families. Uh, the, the problem is we tend to come up with a, a story that we like and fits with our worldview. So, with this one, we might say, well, uh, okay, things aren't really changing, um, but there's a lot going on in this young person's life. Uh, there's all sorts of things going on around them. There's the difficulties at home. So we wouldn't really expect things to, to change. Um, but they're still engaging with the service. They're coming, and so soon we'll expect that things will get better. Fine. Completely coherent story that fits with the data. I think a good role of, of supervisors is to say, okay, that's one story. It fits with the data. But let's just think of another one. Let's think of an alternative explanation for, that might explain this. So an alternative view might be that, um, well, actually, perhaps it's this kind of intervention is not at all helpful for this young person. That, OK, there may be all this stuff going on around in their life, but perhaps we're just not being helpful. So would it be helpful to think about whether uh, a change of intervention or working in a different way, possibly bringing in the family or some other way of working might be a helpful way of doing it? And once you've got those two stories, and I think supervisors can really help create the second one and challenge the first one, then you can start thinking, I think, more helpfully clinically about um, is, is, are we still progressing in the right way? Uh, so I think that's, that's and it, you don't need to understand the tools or the, you only need to have a rudimentary understanding of the tools and the, 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 uh, the data to be able to, to challenge those stories. Okay, any other thoughts or questions at this stage? Right, okay. Um, I'm going to ask you to do something um, because the, 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 the real expertise is between you lot, uh, not up here. Um, so I'm going to ask you to do this. Um, I want you to get into pairs again. Uh, if you're not happy with the person you were sitting next to earlier for the first bit, then feel free to move around. Uh, but if you are, stay with that person. I want one of you to uh, role play a young person. Not a really difficult young person, just your sort of average, curious young person who might come into CAMS. Okay, the other one, other person in your pair, I want you to be, to role play uh, a therapist. You can be yourself if you like, or you can be somebody else. Uh, but to role play a therapist, having a discussion with a young person about any of the tools. So some of you will be familiar with the tools. You can pick whatever one you like. Uh, others, if you're not, then uh, there's a couple that have been handed out. If you want to um, uh, have a go at explaining, what we want you to do is to think, what do you say and do that uh, might encourage a young person to fill out this questionnaire? Okay. Uh, and so the reason for doing this is because uh, it sort of we, what we want to get is to understand the sorts of things that therapists do and say which are helpful and encouraging to young people and helping them understand why this might be a helpful thing for them and also the things that might be helpful to tweak and to improve upon. Okay? Does that sound all right? Yeah? So um, get in your pairs then. We'll let this run for five minutes. Um, and then we'll get some thoughts from you about what worked well and what could be improved. <laughs> okay, what I'd like to ask you now is uh, for those of you who are playing the young people, uh, what was it that your practitioner, therapist, counsellor did or said? It's good to get the actual words and actual things that they did. What was it they did and said which made you feel more inclined to fill out the, uh, the whatever tool or measure they were asking you to do? Just from walking around, my observations were that, and it'd be interesting to know whether any of these things were helpful, 
Uh, there's lots of pointing going on. Um, be interested to know whether pointing helps. Uh, there's quite a lot of laughter, which was nice to see. Uh, does laughter help? Does humor? Smi sorry? Smiling. smiling. OK, right. So is that, is that, a, is that a, a tip already? That uh, Smiling is helpful. Right, OK. Uh, right. Sorry, my dreadful writing. Uh, so what I'd like is to get some uh, feedback from those of you, the young people, from your perspective. What, what was it that worked? What was, what was actually helping? An informed view. What, what, what did... Right. Okay. So an informed view, and was it, it sounds like it was something about how the, the goal setting would, or how, how you might be helped to get to that goal? Was that, was that something that helped with the informed view? Right, yeah. Uh, so it's sort of the informed view, uh, and the sort of big picture, is that, is that a fair summary? Yeah, other. Right, okay, yeah. Right. Right. So, and, and what was it? So, were you playing the parent? Yeah. So, what was it that helped you as a parent to feel comfortable in, in, in that, that? That there may be, you know, what happens if you get a negative score? What did it help? So uh, you may have more than one goal, and you might find sort of helpful progress on one, but not in another, and that's OK. That's kind of what you would expect. So sort of managing kind of expectations around how you would expect things to go was helpful. Right, OK? What else? Not instead of, not separate, but the, it's taking the whole thing together. Right, okay, yep. Conversation, that is. Uh, there, and then we'll come here. And what did they do that gave you the impression that they were taking that one down position? Or what did they, how did they put that across? Okay, so conveying that idea about it being working together, about this will help me to help you, so you can see the benefit of it, and to take that one down position, so you're not saying, I'm the expert, you fill this out, just trust me. It's sort of, um, um, uh, uh, sort of putting across that idea that this, is, this might benefit both of you. Yes, and the marketing as well, it might be. Right. Right. 
Excellent. OK. Uh, so might help rather than will. And uh, that it's about collaboration. And taking the one down helps with the idea of it being collaborative. One over here, yeah. Right. Right. So if there is a sense, and I think it's picked up at the back there, that young people sometimes feel, you know, uh, am I succeeding or failing, depending on how this is going, if you say, actually, this is about me and not about you, then it puts those, perhaps, ideas and fantasies into the therapist rather than into the young person, which can, can help. Right, yeah. Okay, one more positive and then we'll. Uh... Um, my was very in me. Right. Um, How did she show that? So it was interest, being interested in you as a whole person, yes. and the form might help understand you as a whole person, rather than, uh, I was watching, uh, and I was pleased that nobody did like the therapist in that first video that we saw today, where the therapist was hiding behind the clipboard and just sort of marking things off. Uh, so, and we know, and we get repeated uh, feedback from young people that, being treated like a problem or a diagnosis is absolutely not what they want. So if you're treated as a whole person, this is some information to help you understand you as a whole, then that's helpful. If it's just sort of saying, right, you fit into this box, uh, if it's just used as a diagnostic tool, that's unhelpful. Okay? Uh, thank you. So uh, now, uh, thoughts on what, again, sticking with the young people, therapists will get a chance in a minute. Uh, so what was it that the therapist did which you felt actually um, this could be improved upon? Uh, this maybe made you feel less likely to fill it out. And what, what could they have done differently which might have made you feel uh, more likely? Again, this is no, no reflection on the therapist. It's just a role play, and you weren't necessarily playing yourselves today. So, uh, in terms of the role play, what, what could the therapist have done? Uh, how, could, how might they have improved what they said? Right. Okay, so uh, being offered the choice, uh, yeah. And uh, of those of you who use these forms already, how many of you offer not only the choice of whether to fill them out or not, uh, but a choice of which one to, which one to use? Anyone do that? Yeah? Um, what, what, what I do, see if that fits with what you do, uh, with, certainly with the symptom trackers, I would say, look, from what you've told me, um, these are the kind of problems that you want to, to work on and to be different. Uh, here's a couple of questionnaires, uh, which I think ask questions about those problem areas. If we were to use these to sort of, as another bit of information to see how things are going, which one of these would make more sense to you? Normally I just offer a, offer a choice of two, sometimes I offer a choice of three, but that gets a bit overwhelming. Is it right. Hmm. And I don't worry so much about whether it's the one that they've scored highly on. on so if, if you use the RCADs, uh, those of you familiar with it, uh, it breaks it down into sort of uh, six different subcategories, not diagnostic categories, uh, they're indicators. Uh, and I won't always use the one that scores highest because, because I think for young people sometimes that's not the thing that they really want to change, it's something else. And again, in the spirit of better collaborative practice, 
if we can be tracking the thing that the young people particularly are interested in, again, it gives that message of we're interested in working with you on what you want rather than what we as a professional think you ought to have. Okay, so choice, important. Right. And the important dialogue is, is what? So right from the start, if you're going to use these routinely to, to say why you're using them so the young person understands that and then it makes it easier each session after that. So it might take a little bit longer at the start, but quite quick once you get into it. Fine. Uh, okay, other thoughts on improve on what could be done differently? Yeah, I, I think that's right. So it's sort of it's not of direct value to that young person, but it might be of value to the service as a whole. Um, and uh, but uh, okay, let me just fla uh, float this a bit, a bit. I mean, my experience is that young people are uh, incredibly altruistic, actually. Uh, and um, if we say to them again, it's as long as they know the purpose of it and they have the choice. So look, you could say I don't think it's going to be any use to you as an individual in the way that we're working. Just not going to fit. But it might be helpful for us to understand our service better so that we can improve things for other young people coming through. And again, but it's, saying, but it's your choice. Uh, I think if we push it that we have to do it because of the service evaluation, it puts young people off. If we give them the choice and say we'd like to do it, even though it's not a benefit for you, but it's because of service evaluation, uh, and again, it's your choice, then I think young people tend to sort of be, you know, kind of go along with that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And that's where using clinical skills to get honest feedback, so it's easy to get feedback and it's quite easy to get positive feedback. Uh, it's very difficult to get helpful feedback, and the helpful feedback is the kind of critical feedback. Uh, and that's where. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and the, the, the people who, uh, who talk mo most about this are um, uh, Scott Miller and Barry Duncan, uh, who use the SRS, which is the session rating scale, uh, and the, the kind of. The, the, the clinical cutoff, if you like, is at 35 out of 40. Uh, and it, the reason it's set at 35, and this is after a, a lot of use, is because they say young people tend to give really positive feedback all the time, whether you're doing a good job or not. So if you're, if you're getting over 35, you should be suspicious. Um, and what you should see is something that goes, so you tend, young people tend to score as highly uh, and if you then start to see a dip, not below the line, but a dip down towards it, then at this point you might start to think, okay, we're getting more, more honest feedback here. It, it looks bad if you think of it as, you know, but it actually it's helpful because you're getting more honest feedback. It's a sign of that. Equally, if you score below the line, because young people tend to be so positive about anything uh, and any help that they can get, if you're below the line, even if it's at sort of 34, you should really question that because 
it might be that young person is really trying to tell you something, uh, a, a message that they can't quite say out loud. So, so dig a little deeper. Uh, okay, right. Let me throw it out to the clinicians then. You, you can. Yes and no. Um, yes, in that there is a, a, a toolkit, uh, which has got, I can't remember how many questionnaires are in it now, but it's an ever-growing toolkit, which includes the RCADs and lots of other measures, which are the IAPT toolkit. So for the IAPT sites, you're required to hit your 90% target to use uh, at least one of those twice throughout the course of an intervention. But Yes, I suspect they do, but we also know that there are some services that use really good tools that fit, entirely fit their population, which aren't part of the IAP toolkit. It would be awful if people stopped using those and used something that they thought was less valuable instead. So the, again, it gets back to the value bit. So the value bit is about encouraging better collaborative practice and understanding the people that we work with and the services that we work in. If you've got tools that do that well already for your specific population, keep using them. Uh, but you might want to pick another one in addition to that to hit your target, or that might also be useful. Yeah. Yeah. And, and check the ones that you're using already, because the, the toolkit is pretty broad, you might find that actually they're, they're already in there and that's already what you're doing, in which case you're halfway there or three quarters of the way there, probably. Right, uh, two minutes. Throw it out to uh, those of you who were clinicians. Uh, how did it feel to you doing this? What, what, did, what felt all right? What, what didn't? What, what lessons have been learned from this exercise? Okay. Right. Yes. Right, yeah, because you can think in your head, right, I'll just go in, I'll introduce this, this uh, tool to young person, and then you open your mouth and suddenly all sorts of nonsense come out, that's what it was like with me, all sorts of nonsense kind of came out, and I thought, well, I really should have practiced, and I went away and I practiced, and I was better next time, but yeah. So g getting a bit of a script that you can adapt and practicing like this, I think, can be really helpful. And for clinicians who are using, this is new to them, I think having a chance to practice, you know, helps them develop that kind of script, and particularly if you can learn from others like this. Okay, yeah? Right. Yes, yeah, so... Right, and being able to share that with other clinicians who would have those kind of questions, or even, you know, a young person asked me today this question, uh, how might others deal with it? So having, I think really having those opportunities to, to share the real experience with other people is, is really helpful. Because this thing, it, it takes time, you know, and uh, it's a, it is a new thing for, for, for most clinicians. And having those opportunities to share things, and also to be able to share, you know, I did a really stupid thing, or I said this which I thought was really stupid. And, and to, to try and create a safe environment where you can have that conversation. Not like this in an enormous room full of strangers, but uh, yeah. And I think it should be that way around. And I will say this on camera, that I would rather this got used in a clinically meaningful way and we only got 85% yeah. than got 95% and it was, 
not used clinically in a useful way. Because I think if you do use it clinically usefully, then the 90% neatly drops out the back of that. I wish that were entirely true. Uh, but if you, if you drive the 90% target, then uh, it's not helpful for clinicians, it's not helpful for young people. You might get something that might be useful for a service evaluation, but the data that you get back if it's not used in a helpful way is probably not good data anyway. So you, you, you lose that in both ways. Uh, right, okay, uh, we have to stop, uh, but uh, thank you. Just let me leave you with uh, uh, two, two thoughts. One is that these slides will be made available to you. I think they're going to be put on a website somewhere, which you'll be informed of. Uh, and uh, feel free to use them. Uh, and just to nip to the end where, so there's loads of stuff in here which feel free to use it or not as you see fit. Um, but I'll just leave you with these. Again, these, you, these will be all on the thing. So these are helpful sites where there are lots of uh, useful information and videos of uh, clinicians role playing with, with young actors and actresses about using the measures, which can be helpful again for you to look at yourself and think, oh, okay, I like, quite like what they said there, but I didn't like this. Or if you're doing uh, rolling out training amongst your own organizations with other clinicians, there may be videos in there which might be helpful to you to do the training. So please have a look at these. There's lots of stuff on there.